Woo! Woo! That was something. Woo! What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the channel today for another review. Nigeria and Zero here, and we're here for another movie review. Today, we're review, reviewing the film Violation, which is going to be premiering on Shutter March 25th. It just made its Texas debut at South by Southwest. I mean, it's been all over the film festivals. It was at uh, Sundance, I believe, earlier this year, and, uh, and then it was at Toronto International Film Festival. So, like, if you're talking about the big three in film festivals, it unmade its rounds, and that tells you that this film must be something interesting. Uh, one quick note I want to throw in there is that, um, and I told Zero before we even restart, uh, re before we start recording, is that what was interesting to me is that we had an opportunity to view this film before it hit South by Southwest, and I was covering South by Southwest, so I figured I'll skip it because I've already, you know, have has had an opportunity to see it. But what I didn't realize is that with it being on Shutter, nine times out of ten, mostly nine point five out of ten. It's a horror film, which if you put this into translation, that means if it's a horror film, it will be in South by Southwest Midnight Collection. However, it wasn't. It was in the narrative feature category, which I thought was super interesting. And then I started thinking like, oh, OK. So nonetheless, and, and what that means is that narrative feature category is typically films that, you know, has a plot, whatever, whatever, whatever. But you're supposed to walk out of it with a, a message of some sort. And this one definitely did. Um, this was a fantastic film. Um, I don't have all the right words to use for this film, but all I know is that this film really touched on some really sensitive things. And um, overall, as a complete body of work, I, I enjoyed this film. Mm -hmm. I did as well. I think the first thing I thought of after watching this film, before we had even had the discussion about its film festival placement, was already this is this is a genre bender, and you know we have themes of horror obviously throughout the entire film, but I think this film is really interesting because it takes a very loved subgenre in horror, which is the rape revenge, and flips it on its head in a horrible, awful way, <laughs> and I say that in the best way, to get your attention and, and get this message in your head, which is why it was placed where it was in these festivals. Um, so it really bends genres in, in the festival space and also just for horror heads like myself. Yeah, beautifully said. And I even say, you know, with that flipping, like I went into this film, you know, thinking it was a horror, actually being a narrative feature, and it does feel like two both of those genres and they're playing tug of war with each other because the beginning of the film, I thought the opening scene in the score with this really beautiful classical sympathy for the mm -hmm. score. And I love the beautiful color grading that it used. And for me and how I love films that invited me into this film at a really soft point where mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, you start seeing imagery of, of werewolves and, you know, and them being natural in their instinct and, you, and, and their habitat. And you're just thinking, you know, really natural things here. So, like, I felt like it opened me up in one way to, like, massaging me the one way. And then the flip happened. Mm -hmm. And my notes in all bold letters is, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> what is happening here? Like, it's, it's really... It's really crazy how the sound went from, like, again, a classical synth sympathy, synth symphony. I cannot talk. Jeez. Um, <laughs> then they just completely threw that out the window. And then you got some of the most chilling and gruesome sounds. Mm -hmm. I've heard oh, yeah. Like talk about sound. Oh, my gosh. I like, I really had to, like, squinch my face a few times, like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, this I don't one has a bunch of those, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, moments. like, you know, if anybody has the sensitivity, but you know, that like the scratching on the chalkboard sound, not mm -hmm. that annoying, but the reaction you get from it was mm -hmm. the reaction I was getting from some of the sounds. I'm like, oh my God. Like, yeah, not for the screen. Shout out to whoever the Foley artist is in this movie. Cause they had a lot to deal with. Yeah. Um, in a figurative sense also. 
there's lots of sound. And I know, Najir, we love to talk about sound and horror. That's like, I've noticed it's like kind yeah, of a theme of us. The but there, with this one, there's a lot of sound that is kind of thrown into the film that's not, that's not explicitly shown to you visually. Um, and I guess then it's up to the 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 viewer to make that connection. What am I actually listening to? Right yes, now? there's no. it happened a bunch of times. There are these really cool flashback sequences that will happen throughout the film, and and it's kind of like this guessing game. We'll give you the audio first. What's happening? You get that squeamish. I don't think I like this sound. This yep. can't be a good sound. And they play with you until they finally give you the visual, which is something really cool. Um, you usually get all of those up front or it's, you know, that that claustrophobic sound that just kind of lingers throughout the whole film. But this really like plays with that guessing game, which I also think uh, relates back to the theme and the message that you're supposed to take away after the film. So obviously this is a rape revenge. So it's definitely worthy of a trigger warning. Um, yeah. yeah. And I've mentioned before uh, the the rape revenge genre and it's it's importance and it has a place definitely has a place within the horror community and when we talked about lucky i also mentioned the good for her complex and that's why people like rape revenge because you get that catharsis at the end that you know the main character they they get what you know they were owed throughout this entire film it's that release that you get that makes all of this worth it and you know you're rooting for the character and I don't know if you really get that in this one. Um, yeah. And I think that's reflected in the sound, actually, mm, because yeah. you're, it's like you're 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 missing things before you're actually getting the full picture. I'm hearing this weird sound, but I'm not getting the catharsis that comes with the sound yeah. until kind of it's already too late, if that makes any sense. But that was very interesting. We could talk about sound all day. But. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said. That's so so on point. Uh, a couple of things I, I definitely want to throw out there um, is Madeline Sim Fewer. I just want to uh, do apologize if I pronounced her name incorrect. Um, she's wearing three hats here, as she is, you know, your uh, star of the film playing uh, Miriam. She's also your director and also your writer. I thought she did a tremendous job uh, in all departments here. I, I, I could probably go about that for about 10 minutes, but a tremendous job. Mm -hmm. I also want to give um, credit to Adam Crosby, your cinematographer, because here's the thing. Now, the sound was absolutely amazing, but right next door to the sound was the cinematography because some of these close-up visuals that you got and the shot of detail was so good, but it wasn't just that. It was exactly what you just said about how these specs of imagery was conspicuous and really symbolic and it was kind of the idea of like you are able to make what you think is to come what this is and just the whole perception of the bigger view and i like i don't want to go off the limb too far but i almost feel like i haven't seen a film with the use of cinematography and audio in this way that this left me in turmoil as to like, there's a lot happening. <laughs> yeah, it's and a I, lot happening. And they leave it for you to figure out yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that we just discussed about the sound, but it also comes with the visuals, with the the those close-up shots where it's yeah. like, what am I looking at here? Mm -hmm. and, and it lingers. So you really have to think about what the hell am I looking at? And mm -hmm. by the time you might figure it out, even if you might not be so sure, we're already on to the next sequence and we're back into exactly. reality again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And like, there's, I feel like there's no throwaway in the, in the imagery because like, even, mm -hmm. you know, there's a scene where there's a, a spider trapped under a glass. And you're thinking like, well, they spent so much time on this, but why? But you see it come mm -hmm. full circle. And then mm -hmm. you realize that every bit of, of anything you see on screen serves a purpose. And again, it's for your interpretation to kind of really put together the symbolic nature of it and mm -hmm. or why it's conspicuous in the way it is. And I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to go any further without uh, mentioning the synopsis here. So a troubled woman on the edge of divorce returns home to her younger sister after years apart. But when her sister and brother-in-law portrays her trust, she embarks in a vicious crusade of revenge. So, you know, you definitely highlighted 
the 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 more because I don't feel like the synopsis truly does it justice. It doesn't. But you 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 yeah. nailed on some other parts, and I want you to kind of emphasize a little bit more that you can on this about the just the the nature of the subgenre. Yeah, like beef, yeah, beefing it up just a little bit more because I feel like the synopsis don't really. Yeah, I was, you for. I I was prepared for rape revenge. Mm -hmm. The the synopsis gives a basic, you know, what you think you're going to be in for. Um, you know, a woman is the victim of sexual assault. She gets angry and seeks her revenge for you know the the oppression that she's been put through, and then something happens. At the end. Um, which in a nutshell, yeah, is what happens, but that's clearly not the point here. Yeah. Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the video about the catharsis that comes with rape revenge, which is kind of the whole point behind the subgenre, um, the lack of that here really pushes you to think about why am I watching this? You know, um, cause to a degree, all of this stuff is fantasy. You know, this this horror stuff is fantasy. We use it to get away um, as metaphors for things. But the reason why this one is is so firm and so hard to watch, um, even for people who do like rape revenge, is because it doesn't follow within those guidelines. It doesn't give you that catharsis for a reason. And there's a big reason that they're not telling you in this short synopsis and i don't want to give away too much and i really think that each viewer should think about this this message for themselves but it's clear in a not clear way at all it uses that here we're gonna toy we're gonna uh dangle this weird sound in front of you until you guess it we're gonna show you this really weird imagery until maybe you can make something of it and then it's kind of up to you to put those pieces up together and then when we finally reach the end, I think it's very apparent what this film is trying to say in the face of horror, rape, revenge films. It, this definitely had that subgenre in mind because it was so blatantly teasing you that this is what we're going to give you, but at the same time, bending the genre completely bending the reason why people come to this genre and i think that's really smart and hey it might be bleak and, and it might be depressing but that's the reason why this film has landed so many different placements in yeah. its festivals that it's been through is because it's it's important and it's it's very clear i i can say with a hundred percent certainty there are survivors of of sexual abuse behind this movie because yeah there would be no other way to to tell it a story this important with this much realism completely ditching the fantasy element period and there's there's it's it's hard to to tell a story like that without having that experience and it really it's shocking yeah. and it's hard to watch it's morbid but i think not i think i know they do that on purpose they're sending a message here that i don't want to say but y'all can figure it out <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you're entirely right. Uh, when you look at the different projects that both uh, Madeline, again, if I apologize, if I'm saying her name incorrect, and Dusty Manicelli, who's also the co-director on this, you look at their other projects that they've done, such as Chubby, um, and um, there's a, there's another short that they did, Rape Car. Like this is something obviously that. Uh, the the really big advocates about and they they bring it to the forefront so you know like they're speaking uh, from a righteous standpoint where uh, you know as you said this is this is something that's out there and um, just this happens to be part of their message and their motivation into filmmaking and that's why it comes off the way it does and mm -hmm. and I and I, I'll go a step further and saying like this film uh, you know with the story of revenge and um, I'll ultimately talk about the the societal uh, rape culture. Um, this film doesn't really show you anything you don't know. And if you like myself, who watches ID channel all the time, you've seen this story play out a billion different times. But I think, and and, and just to piggyback off of what you said, what's unique about it is because it's up for your interpretation to really come to the conclusion as mm -hmm. to what the message that is trying to say, the mm -hmm. plot and the story, you, you've seen it to some extent. But yeah. The message is what I think is, uh, uh, which makes this film unique and different. 
and uh and and satis and, and satisfying because uh you know again from still looking at it as a complete body of of work you know it's always the idea of what you can take from out of the theater and mm -hmm. i think when you're able to take out your interpretation and still be right you, there is really no wrong answer i would say here i mean obviously there is their message but i think they left it in the way for you to be mm -hmm. able to go out and, and have a conversation i think that's what's right. good about it you um, will 100 percent get the message just by how you feel after watching yeah. this one. That, there's there's no, almost no way to avoid it. You will bingo. feel it. Bingo, bingo. Now that's gonna do it for our review. However, we're gonna just talk really quickly about the ending. So we're gonna explain that, or at least give our thoughts of the explanation of the ending here. I just got a quick line on it. Again, uh, I just advise you, you can listen to the review all the way out, but this is definitely um, not so spoilerly, it's just because it's our interpretation, because you can dig whatever you want after you go see it. But nonetheless, just be aware that it will be a little bit more specific as to um, what we're talking about here. But with the closing shot here, and again, we're talking about the end and explain, I think that what, we, what we're getting from the two sisters, Miriam and Greta, is that, um, you know, there was conflict and a level of distrust between the two sisters, as we know. And I think the idea that Miriam is, is really broken inside, maybe hopeless, I mean, definitely hopeless. And almost even, I can almost say, it goes as far as saying a shell of herself. Mm -hmm. She's looking out at people, having ice cream, wine, laughs and all that. But I think that what what I made from it is that, and I think it's very, very light. And I, that's why I'm very curious to know what you said. I think... You know, Greta putting her hand on Miriam's leg is just to let her know that um, she's there for her and she's her sister no matter what. Even if it's no fun and games involved, no fun games and laugh, all that perception of what you think are an ideal couple, household, relationship, whatever it may be that you're seeing. Although there seems to be a little bit of turmoil here, I think she gave her that satisfactory, like, I get it. We don't look like the traditional happy house or happy sisters, but I got you regardless mm -hmm. and i think that that in contrary to the dreams i think is probably why she's that conflict murder is probably a conflict and we've seen like a like a sigh of relief through through emotions so mm -hmm. um, I, I i just think it was just one of those like sisterly moments that mm -hmm. uh is is really troubling for Miriam overall mm -hmm. the one thing that will break me in cinema and television and in just storytelling in, in general is a is a good sisterly bond story that's like like fuck a romance like i could do without that but a sisterly <laughs> bond story will like tear me down when the, i couldn't even handle um gamora and nebula in guardians <laughs> 2. like i really couldn't but i don't really i don't i have to do some more thinking about the dream sequence yeah i don't I don't really know the significance in her, I don't want to say pity, but no, her, her guilt for dr dream dreaming what she did. It felt like it was like some sort of baggage or guilt that she was holding with her. I, I don't really understand because her sister Loki gaslit her and didn't say sorry. We got no closure after that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't really... The sister was kind of dead to me after that point. I was like, nah, that's that's it for me. But the ending where she puts her hand on her sister's thigh and they're just like at this picnic and they're enjoying people being happy. And our protagonist is clearly not happy. I I took that as like the depressing ending of you're going to have to pretend that you're fine now. Mm. And, and carry this baggage with you because look at all these happy people and we're here alive and healthy and mm. and I think I feel that way because I never got that closure with the sister mm. um, and it felt very fabricated if I can just like erase that scene where they they talk about the dream that she, that she had that I still have to process yeah. a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah it just felt very fabricated like a, a false sense of joy that mm. she should be feeling after she takes care, after she gets her revenge, what she needed in, spoiler alert, killing that man. Um, she should be feeling that catharsis that we usually do feel with rape revenge. We should be feeling that, oh, good for her. 
the world is better off without that man. But that's that's not the honest truth. That's, you know, most women who experience sexual assault don't get that good for her moment. And, you know, even if you can take it to court, hell, may, even if you do murder him, it's not the closing of the book. You know, the closing of the book and saying good for her, she did it. That's the fantasy part of horror. And that's why we come to these movies, because we can feel good, close the book at the end of the day and it's done. But this film is telling me with that last scene that like, this doesn't happen. This isn't real. And in, in, even if you can get that revenge that you're owed, you can get that, that ending of the book that, you know, that whoever did this to you, you know, basically asked for, it's not the closing of the book. And at this point, I feel like our character, our main character is going to have to go through a life of false happiness and hiding this or not hiding this, but suppressing these emotions because everything around her at that point is happy. Everyone's eating ice cream and she's with her sister finally again after she had a falling out, which would break me. It would give me all the happiness that I need, but it's this over, you know, this cloud that's hanging over her head that, you know, she still experienced that. And even though it's done, it still sticks with her and I should be happy, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Sorry to put it that way, folks. Yeah. But that's what I got from this. Yeah, almost to a point where it's like, maybe she thinks she's in a dream by looking at what is considered to be yeah. happiness and she's it's not like happy. It's like that kind of veil complex where like everybody else is on the other side of the curtain yeah. having a great like, time. And the curtain is mesh, so I can see them and technically I'm having a good time with them, yeah. but I'm not really there. It's a, it's a being on punishment looking out the window thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, Mom won't let me come outside and play. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, folks, this is Violation. It's premiering March 25th on Shudder as a Shudder original film. Many people have already checked this out at numerous film festivals. This is a film. Definitely check it out. Let us know in the comments what you thought about this film. Um, definitely get your theories and your explanations and all that down there. We're definitely curious to know your thoughts. Um, definitely in the description below, check out Zero's uh, social media. Give her a follow and review check out her reviews and all that other stuff but as always folks thank you so much for checking out this review and stay around because many reviews are on the way so thank you so much and we'll see you then big old bell